Wizards and Witches. It is I, your host, Keats Ross. This is the Prag Magic Podcast, and I will keep this short and sweet because the following conversation is quite extensive. Um, it has truly been a privilege to host Saraf the Mage. Uh, not only are his dabblings in audiomancy and spellcraft via his Saraf the Mage uh, experiment YouTube channel, or his video casting, podcasting with the eclectic crew of The Lost Word, Saraf and I are very very similar and that we both have overcome dark paths with the aid of magical praxis. In this discussion, we will chat about our dark desert days, our continual but fluctuating beliefs of the unseen realms, our excitement and criticisms of current culture, which seems to be a common thread with these recent episodes, uh, the use of media magic, dead geniuses and their problematic roads, and what that would mean for our current Kind of outrage culture. Uh, but I think most importantly, we discuss magic as redeemer. Uh, before I go, I want to thank my patrons, uh, new and old, from Baz of the Lost Word podcast, Alex Bolin of the Alex Cast, Eric Arneson of Arnomancy, Derek Hunter of Love Chaos, uh, Vanessa Kindle, Charm the Water. I want to thank all of you for your continual support. And uh, that's it. Um, so Slither Hither, Weirdos and Witches, you're about to view and or hear uh, the conception of what I believe to be a long and wondrous international friendship with the new We the Hallowed Haunt, Mr. Sadoth the Mage. Stay corny 2020 and haunt on. Start. Where, where are you located right now? Let's, let's get where I'm that is. I'm in uh, Aberdeen, Scotland. Nice which is a, a beautiful sort of, uh, it's kind of on the same latitude as Moscow, so it's very cold. Mm. It's mostly made out of granite, so it's very gray. They call it the Granite City or the Silver City, but I mean, it's just, it's, it's quite a depressing little place, to be honest. It's my hometown. Never quite got up the momentum to get out of here. That's and, beautiful. Uh, and that's in part due to problems I had as a, uh, you know, in my early 20s, drifted into some serious drug abuse, mm -hmm. heroin addiction, crack cocaine, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So my origin story is uh, we could begin it last, I mean, well, well, where does it start? The first book on magic I ever got was out of my high school library. It was uh, David Conway's Occult Primer when I was about mm -hmm. 14. And I read about this fantastic world, the astral plane, and it seemed so separate and it seemed a place that only mediums or, or clairvoyants or someone with some kind of talent like that. So I read it assiduously, but I never thought I would actually become a magician. Right. So like this was just kind of a peripheral want. Were you always a spiritual type person? Were you always a seeker? I would, uh, it's difficult to say. I was always a very bookish young child. Right. You know, I spent a lot of time just reading, reading, reading. Like James Herbert was the first author mm -hmm. I really got into when I was, oh God, possibly preteen. Then I moved on to Stephen King. I loved Hammer Horrors. I, I had a. Mm, oh, yeah. Hammer yeah. Horror uh, for me, and it, it just summed up all that sort of gothic women with big breasts and right. sexiness, you know, when you're just becoming an adolescent you're not quite sure what sex is but, but you, you know it's kind of there star trek mm -hmm. also is quite uh, erotic for me so it makes sense then that the occult would be you know something very tasty to you oh because absolutely it's, it's, yeah. you know this hidden kind of ideology and stuff so exactly. that it started with that book yeah and i think also, I really wanted, I think I was um, dying to grow up. I wanted to grow up really fast because the kids around me seemed like they were so young and I, I was really interested in girls at a very early age. I was very into music. And it just like, I wanted to be a teenager long before I was a teenager. And I also discovered like my granddad had a, a big radiogram. I've got very fond memories of my grandparents, like my maternal grandfather pretty much brought me up and he had a big radiogram and I discovered one special record and it was a Rolling Stones record through the past darkly mm -hmm. uh, so I was listening to that I was I was going to see Greece like uh, twice a day in the summer holidays just 
dying to be a teenager and dying to get out of my mundane little child world, you know? Yeah. I mean, already I see the parallels between us pretty consistent. It's amazing. It makes me think, too, this idea of needing to grow up fast um, that probably led to maybe the issues that we both had in our early 20s and yeah. coming of age because we didn't have our childhoods early. No, no. My dad was a major alcoholic. He was a, he was a captain in the merchant navy, but he would be away for like six months and then he'd come back and there'd be all kinds of chaos in the house. So, And yeah. I had to also look after my little brother. So I did have kind of adulthood forced upon me in many ways. Yeah, I was also what we call a latchkey kid. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the kid that walks home alone and takes care of the siblings. Yeah, so I, I absolutely yeah. read you on that one. But uh, it makes us stronger, you know? Yeah, and I mean, that's pretty much the crux of what I want to talk to you about because after watching your videos, I always ascertain that we kind of come from that same ilk. And it does, I think, begin with outsiderdom. It does begin with, you know, feeling uh, out of place, maybe out of time, out of mind you know absolutely and I, I recognize that in your videos as well i have to say i, I thought there's a there's a brother from another mother right there <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> strange ilk you know yeah yeah i think um you know not to say we're hugely intelligent or creative but we seem to be reasonably intelligent and creative and you know i think it's it, the internet that has brought us together, you know, we're, we're little isolated souls in these one horse towns. And now uh, just in the last five or six years, there's like an internet community building and people are connecting with each other. And I think that's really interesting. And that's part of the reason I started the channel. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's been great. Uh, I think you contacted me. Um, it's been a while now. I mean, we've been wanting to do this for so long and I apologize. I've had it's the craziest month and a half or so but i've really always really in, like i found your your work to be endearing i've always felt that it was there's a large sea of of things once you get into this line of thought right there's a large group of maybe nefarious bad actors and and yeah, weird you know weird intentioned people and uh it's been like just it's been nice to know that you you've got an honest voice among it. Well, absolutely. That's that's one of the main things. That's another reason why I started the channel was, you know, I saw a lot of um kind of occulty magic videos where it just didn't seem realistic to me. These guys are summoning up demons like that, oh, and yeah. you know, <laughs> evoke and they're they're bros and you know, they're giving it's just bullshit, man. You know, there's so much bullshit out there. It's just, you know, I want to give a more um, nuanced view of magic because it's a very subtle thing, you know. You, you don't right. have demons appearing in puffs of smoke when you do a ritual. It's a very psychological process. Right, right? yeah. In I fact, wondered... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, in fact, I would say it's... I'm getting to the point where I'm almost dismissing the whole idea of anything existing now this is a temporary phase i switch feet on this every day but i really i'm doubting the the existential existence of like spirits and demons that live in this other place mm -hmm. i really do think they're all parts of our psychology in some way honestly that's where i've been I, I had to take some time off in the past month and a half to kind of reconstitute myself within this because um it's not dissimilar to spiritual burnout, but it's kind of a lot there. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it, it almost is spiritual burnout after listening to these people and, you know, understanding that I know less and less as more, as more I know, the more I know, the less I know, the less I know. Yeah. Has yeah, been like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. At 16, I thought I knew everything. I could explain God, the universe. Everything. Right. The more you actually learn, the more you realize, Jesus, I know nothing at all. And that's why I don't want to come at things as a teacher or an expert, God forbid. I'm just a, a, a chaotic experimentalist. Right. You're a practitioner, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And what I was going to say with the other point, with the idea that, you know, this is I, I said this in podcasts before that it is essentially it's a good uh, psychological, you know, recalibration. This stuff is great for that. 
Um, and I think sometimes at the end of the day, that's all you need it to be. And I think once you get through the waves of people who really like the pomp and circumstance of the dog and pony show, as we say here, uh, you know, I had sex with the demon, you yeah. know, and it was, and it was real and whatnot. I mean, it's, there's, there's a place for that. And I do, I don't want to discount people's experiences, but that no. has not been mine. No, absolutely not. And yeah. you know, you, you know, it gets views. I presume it gets some loads of money. But are they right. just are they just bullshitting like famous bullshitters from other you know like the conspiracy world? I've, I've got a bit of a tie in with a lot of the guys from this sort of skeptical, um, like CW Chanter and guys like that. Oh yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I've been following CW so, for a bit. Yeah. So exposing bullshit's a lot of what I'm about as well. You know. Yeah. I want to. I want to give people a real idea of the occult because when I came into it, I thought, why can't I astrally project? And like, uh, you know, the, the idea is even that book, that first book, uh, The Occult Primer, gave me the idea that the astral plane was a completely separate place. It was like entering a room. You'd know when you were in there. Right. But more and more, I'm beginning to realize that it's all about the power of imagination and the power of creativity. So now as someone like myself, an ex, you know, drug addict, just to be blunt about it, um, maybe we're always still drug addicts, but, you know, that's not in my realm anymore. But I often think back at that. That's kind of what formed me and what helped me get where I am in weird, sadistic ways, maybe, but still to be true. You know, I wonder if why we need to take more of a realistic and honest approach because in a way we have been numbing the psychic senses for so long. We know what it's like to be completely, you know, either out of our mind or completely docile in a weird way. Yeah, I think that's it. And I think um, possibly we use drugs to try and find that, um, that kind of other world, you know, yeah. I used to always fantasize when I was a, a child, there was a, a, a lane, it was a beautiful sort of, it was covered in, you know, just something out of like Narnia, which books I loved. And there was uh, Jamie in the toll booth as well, where a, a flesh and blood person would just enter this cartoon world. And taking drugs for me was like attempting to get into that cartoon world. Right. Yeah. But so, never really manifested that way, right? No. But I mean, I, Although, Not with the, I mean, the hard drugs, maybe psychedelics. And, yeah, and yeah. Psychedelics, oh, yeah. psychedelics have played a huge part in my uh, right. magical development, if you will. But mm -hmm. the hard drugs, yeah, uh, heroin is a, a terrible, horrible drug. But, yeah. you know, I still maybe wouldn't trade, I, I maybe wouldn't give it 20 years of my life like I did. Right. Yeah. It was an interesting place to be. And I think... Not the being numbed out on heroin, but when you're actually in withdrawal, that's when the interesting things, the psychic sort of phenomenon happen for me. It's almost like, you know, demonic possession too, in a way. It's yeah, yeah. I, I often think of the poppy as an intelligent demon who will invade your body. And it really is, you know, it, it builds camp in your body. Yeah. It won't move out and it, it won't let you go, you know. It's taken me a long time. And I'm still on a small amount of uh, suboxone and diazepam. Yeah, but I think that's yeah. another one for me. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's incredible, though. I often try to reconfigure those experiences. Like, I want nothing more than the take the shit I've done in my life that has, you know, been self-serving or, or, you know, uh, immoral in some ways to a degree. I always want to take that and try to figure out a way to make that into something positive, right? And I think that's what, like, I think that's why us, you know, deeply spiritual or de deeply, yeah, I hate to say that, like, I'm deeply spiritual, <laughs> <laughs> you know, us, the, and I hate to use the word seeker too, if we can come up with another word for this. But people that are always on the hunt, it's this need for um, clarity of purpose. And I think we're intentful people that just, you know, our, our purpose got aligned or misaligned, I mean, got misaligned in some ways. And what I was addicted to a lot was that clarity of purpose, was that everything mm -hmm. fell except yeah. for this thing, you know? Well, and, yeah, the, the only thing that matters is you got the drug or you didn't get the drug that right. day. And if you got the drug, it was a good day. If you didn't, it was a bad day. And it makes your life very, very simple, you know? Very simple, yeah. As soon as I got off, in a sense, you know, the 
you know, I mean, the the fact is we're both survivors of that addiction, mm-hmm. but I've I've lost many friends to it, you know. So that's yeah. something that gives a little pat on the back. And I do think that um, having the people that I know that fell by the wayside really didn't have any other interest. They weren't interested in art, music. Right. And that's magic, what I mean. You know? Yeah, that's what I mean to come so, back to is, yeah, what so we the thing that, that pulled us out. Route. Yeah, yeah, we had an yeah. escape route. Mm-hmm. But what, what do you think that was? So you were you were already kind of, and like I was too, I was peripheral with the occult or, or, or with knowledge and, you know, spirituality and everything. I've I've always been somebody that has been deeply interested in it. But, you know, what do you think is, is the thing that pulled us away from that? Uh, I, like I say, I think I was always, I wouldn't say it was a means, drugs were a mean to an end, but they always felt like a stopgap for me. I always felt like I was treading water till I found my true yeah. will, if you like, because I was. Exactly, yeah. And, uh, you know, I drifted in and out of art school. I was in a band for a while. The band was actually where I picked up my heroin habit, funnily enough. Mm. Musicians yeah. <laughs> and heroin, man. But, I know, walking cliches we are. But I think what really uh, kicked me out of it was I met a woman who had not been into heroin and she basically offered me a place to shelter and kind of, um, kind of, you know, just gave me a normal place away from the, the junk crowd and stuff to mm-hmm. kind of recuperate. And she was very into Reiki and... Uh, she wasn't really into magic as I'd known it, you know, like Crowley sure. and Burroughs and stuff. But she, she was kind of new agey, but it was with her that I first had my real uh, flowering as, you know, my first truly weird uh, experiences, which I, I might go into. Yeah, no, please do. It sounds like you found a beauty in faith. like Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. just a, a life away from... Because I always knew there was a life away from that. I always had other stuff going on, you know? Yeah. But, uh, you get so entrenched in that, that uh, mouse wheel of scoring and, you know, and she just gave me a break from that. And then uh, quite wonderful things developed from that relationship. And we're still friends, you know? Yeah, that's amazing. It's it's something, there's something so, uh, like, symptomatic of the material realm about drugs. You know, they're almost like for a person not taking care of these, you know, higher functions of the mind or the subconscious, it's almost like we're all predestined to just kind of drop into the numbing void, <laughs> you know, yeah. unless we have to dig our way out and find our way, you know, it's a hero's journey in a, in a funny uh, way. Absolutely, so. yeah, it is. yeah, yeah, yeah. So after, you know, she brought you out, what was it, was it Crowley that, Kind of got you more interested into the ritual magic? Well, I'd, I'd read Crowley before my addiction, and I still dabbled with magic while I was addicted, you know. But, I mean, you can't uh, devote yourself to... And, in fact, I find it uh, still hard to devote myself to serious practice because life gets in the way, you know. Yeah. But um, I had a very strange experience. Uh, she'd been doing Reiki, and she'd been going to like a, a spiritual center where they did like kind of vague spiritual healing. And I'm really not into that fuzzy New Age stuff. Yeah, and I thought I can maybe guide her in a way uh, to to more concrete magic as I saw it. So it was a kind of mixing of the, and also I thought it was like a mixing of the male and female energies. So one day um, she'd been doing Reiki for about a year, and I'd never thought of saying, "Okay, just do Reiki on me." So one day she got me in the chair and, you know, I'm not prone to flights of fancy. I'm very skeptical and I analyze things to the, to the nth degree. But this day um, I just sat there, blanket wrapped around me. And within a few minutes of her doing this Reiki, I suddenly was shot out of my body and I saw the, I've told this story before, but I might Mm -hmm. tell that again. And I saw the earth is that like, you know, that classic blue marble photograph, like I was seeing it from far, far out in space. And I had no idea what was going on. I just uh, kind of, but it was like a, the, the way I, you know, like if it's a daydream, you kind of flit about and it's, you know, you're obviously still caught in that train of thought. But this was just, there was nothing else there. I was in that vision out of my body, looking down on the planet Earth. And it was like, I got the corniest message. It was like, we are the Palladians. We are the Palladians. (laughs) 
look at the earth and I don't believe in Pleiadians, never have, you know. Right. So I thought that's a strange thing. If I was to have a vision, I would have hoped it would have been, you know, because I was heavily into Crowley, but it, was, sure. it would have been more, this is Horus, you know, you are yeah. the new child of the. Clem Snide comes and slaps you in the face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or a mugwump comes up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but no, it was nothing like that. It was a total new age thing about ecology and all that. And it was apparently, I felt the tears, on, it wasn't tears of emotion. There was just water coming out of my eyes and I was kind of shaking. And she sensed there was something going on. So we came out of that. She was like, oh my God, it must have been the Pleiadians. You know, who else would it be? And I was like, ah, I don't really believe in Pleiadians. And why would they give me an ecological message? I'm not terribly interested in ecology. You know, I'm quite a selfish <laughs> bastard. Wrong when guy. It comes to that. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> um, so we, we talked about it. And then we thought, hmm, well, if that can happen, let's experiment a little bit more. And I can't remember exactly how it happened, but she was pushing me in a new agey way. So I was pushing her more in a sort of ritual magic kind of way. So the two kind of got mixed up together and we came up with this hodgepodge of rituals and uh, meditations and actually started channeling. Uh, it's another thing I, you know, I came away from it. We got reams and, you know, we used to voice record it and stuff. Right, yeah, yeah. And I, a lot of it was very beautiful, poetic sort of stuff, but nothing that I would really stand by now. You know, I look upon it as a weird sort of psychological quirk that happened in a time where I was pretty spaced out through being strung out on air. Right. It's, it's like your astral dexterity needs time to practice yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, I mean, yeah. we did get a lot of valuable ideas. You know, we, we got the idea that Toth or Thoth, as we used mm -hmm. to call them, and then it kind of got mixed in with Thoth and Isis, so it became Thosis. We channeled our magical names. So I do believe that... Um, any information that you can look at, you know, it's like tarot cards. You don't believe that the tarot cards actually have supernatural power in themselves. Right. They're a good some tool do. for analysis. <laughs> well, some do, yeah. yeah. But for me, they're just a way of making you look at certain things that you wouldn't have otherwise. So Absolutely. This channel, yeah. So you could look at the channeling process as a kind of cut up of my own consciousness and perhaps some of hers. Right. And then you have to look at your motivations. Am I telling her what she wants to hear? Which I think in some cases I was. Sure, but that's unadulterated, right? That's like yeah, uh, yeah. free speech, or is it uh, automatic, you know, rhyming or automatic yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it just, freestyling? It just, yeah, yeah. I, I do believe it came from me, but it was perhaps coming from a, I mean, I was in a kind of trance state when I did it, you know. Well, let's, think, let's, let's talk about that. Do you think that that was simply just a higher conscious your super self or was that you know um maybe something coming in through you that well, wasn't you essentially i think it was me i think it was a super self or a, the, the higher consciousness kind of right. thing because like i say at the moment i'm doubting that anything really does exist outside you know i don't yeah. believe there are spirits lurking about in some undefined fourth dimension that interact with humans, although I could be wrong on that. And um, but my thinking is at the moment that it was just it accessed a part of my brain that I don't, you know, because the brain is an amazing thing. Right. I mean, it's just so funny how similar we are. I mean, this past month and a half, I really did take time to kind of sit back and reevaluate, you know, my intentions or what what I, you know, just kind of normally see as happening. And it really, it always comes down to that it's just, you know, conversation, uh, communion with your subconscious. And that's the highest thing you can commune with. And it's the greatest thing that runs your life. You know, it's not necessarily just this disembodied consciousness from somebody else or somewhere else. You know? I do believe in the collective unconscious and right. you know, the archetypal realm. I mean, that's for sure. I've experienced the neither, times. neither. Yeah, the yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, or neither, neither. Yeah, neither, neither. I would say, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I, I am. That's why I, I recently um, published that uh, Alistair Crowley's uh, introduction to the McGregor's Mather Goetia thing. Right. He is saying, you know, these are just specific parts of your brain, and he flim flammed, flim flammed. He uh, yeah vacillated between okay, there are objective spirits out there. And that's why I admire Crowley, because he, he always questioned 
what he was doing, you know, and like uh, Robert Andrew Wilson would do later. And, exactly. You know, and the, the occultists I admire are the ones that don't just go off on flights of fancy and, and puff themselves up like certain magicians are current on various media <laughs> platforms. Like right. Magicians, you know what I mean? <laughs> I know it's really hard. Uh, there's a there's a part of me that wants to. I talk to my my good friend who's an illustrator and a practitioner, um, all the time, and we we kind of gripe to each other about different things we stumbled on with new, you know, this neo magician or it's almost like this neo chaos magic in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, you know, the self serving. It's the it's the what it, we call the new guru. You know. Yeah, yeah, and it's really hard because you know part of my I think my outsiderdom uh, from when I was a kid is always skeptical of anybody that's gaining popularity. So I don't want to superimpose my my bullshit on them, but it's I'm finding a way to to discuss this without necessarily naming names, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You That's know? Not name names. But I do believe that, you know, um, I don't believe in supernaturalism. I don't think that right. things can just manifest out of nowhere. But magical effects are very real, you know. Like when I started experimenting with sigil magic, I have no idea what causes that mechanism. But within about two months, I'd inherited a huge sum of well, not a huge sum of money. I went through it pretty quick. But, uh, you know, a, a great aunt that I'd never even known existed. Um, through a weird chain of synchronicities. The, my mother had a, a kind of nurse who also worked part-time in a solicitor's office. Um, she knew my mom and overheard the solicitor saying, oh, we're looking for these guys, Alistair and Stephen Ray, me and my brother. She mm-hmm. went back and told my mom. My mom got in touch with the solicitor. They were like, oh, did you know that your, your grandfather bought a share in this house? We've got tens of thousands of pounds. And it seemed like as soon as I started doing that, everything, you know, I, I, I really, after the devastation and, you know, absolute homelessness, really. Yeah. Although I did have some support networks around me and I was never completely like on the streets, like begging with a cop. I was pretty much derelict. And then as soon as uh, the magic started and as soon as this thosis thing started to pick up momentum, everything started slotting into place. So was it me putting myself together or was it some outside force? I I just can't tell. It's hard. I I often call, call it like the you know, the paradox of being a coincidence conductor. Yeah, or a, you know? or a synchronicity <laughs> generator. Exactly, yeah. yeah Which is like, well, yeah, everything, all the dominoes fell in place, but would I have noticed, you know, if I didn't put the intention out there first? Would I, you know, would it? maybe it's, uh, it, it's a gratitude thing with the intention. I think sometimes, too, when it comes to ritual work or spiritual work, or praxis even like it's about a future gratitude you know Mm -hmm. you're giving you're you're saying thank you for uh allowing these things to happen you know that puts me forth to my true will but in a weird way it's still a surrender you know oh yeah Uh, i think uh surrender is a a big part of it after the isis magic and uh me and that i mean we were boyfriend and girlfriend at the time and we split up mm-hmm. and i kind of drifted more into traditional magic i started uh, like a self-initiated golden dawn and the golden sure. dawn uh curriculum especially self-initiated without the help of a lodge or anything is really not my cup of tea but for some reason oh it's right it, it uh Again, a synchronicity. She was in Treadwells in London, a famous bookshop in London. Yeah. And this book, Kabbalah Magic, just fell off the shelf. So she brought it back. We both started working. We split up and I continued working. So I went right through the neophyte grade, you know, doing everything very scrupulously daily because I wasn't working at this point. Went through Zelator, Theodicus. And at Theodicus, uh, you could say my practice fell apart, but you could also say I started to work full time. I got a job where I was reasonably responsible and trusted you know so uh, you know you take with one hand right with the other yeah but yeah i feel yeah i mean that's a good example i you know i keep bringing up this weird hiatus because we're in the same spot now where i'm i i'm just coming back into this realm because i needed some time off to get my feet dirty 
I needed to feel the material realm. I needed to, yeah. you know, focus on, on the material or the somatic, yeah. you know, and, I mean, um, this stuff can it, definitely sweep you away in a tide of madness. Right. And, yeah. Uh, it's an as above, so below thing, truly, you know, and I, I hear about all the time and trans transcendental meditation. There are naysayers, ex members who come out and say, you know, I lost everything because that was a place I would escape to. And I just wanted to be there, <laughs> you know? Mm, yeah. And it just, it makes me think that, yeah, that for a time I was caring uh, too much about my head, not anchoring myself or not yeah. my head, maybe my heart. I'm not sure. But yeah. I get that when you start to parlay both, you know, the the praxis and the material stuff, when it starts becoming pragmatic, I hate to use the term, but like that's Great to term. me the greatest, you know, idea of what this stuff is capable of. Yeah. And uh, I think my crisis was I got overwhelmed with the amount I was reading and you know, and then there's the videos and then there's the praxis. And, oh, yeah. Know, there's just so many words and so many competing systems. It just got so confusing for me. I just kind of short-circuited and just like, oh. enough. And egos. Egos yeah. against where you should start. Uh, you yeah. know, like that was the big thing for me was just the incessant um, naysaying about how I did this or where I did this or what I did. You know, even in my mind, knowing because reading the text, reading how people like interact with each other in these very disparate, you know, systems. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. See, I don't know that many other magicians that I can actually talk to. Recently, I've met, uh, you know, well, I've known Sam for a while, Baz from The Lost Word, which we can maybe talk about later. But yeah, I that's actually great... think, I think it's a benefit to maybe not get too involved with too many other magicians and too many yeah. other ways of thinking, you know, because I think magic is really about finding your own way through this minefield of, uh, psychonautery. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I take that, I take that to heart very much. I, I think often that, you know, and I talk to this about Mitch Horowitz, like we're all speaking the same language, different terms. Absolutely. This confusion yeah. of terms is, you know, in philosophy, you've got more concrete terms. And even, you know, I did English at university. There's definite terms. But in magic, everybody's using different terms, talking about the same thing. And it's it's very confusing and frustrating as hell, you know? Yeah. Is that why you kind of started, quote unquote, the experiment was, you know, like what I'm doing as well is that we're just trying to glean and learn and put yeah. ourselves out there and, yeah 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 i think so yeah. it was like find the others you know that famous terence mckenna quote oh yeah because i was aw very aware that when I, I split with the the magical partner i had that i just had nobody and my uh inspiration level seemed to drop and I, I was trying to come off uh last summer was a real turning point for me i had been you know I'd, i was in a job i was i was solid in the job I still hadn't managed to kick the last bit of the drugs, benzodiazepines, Valium, uh, Xanax, all that kind of stuff. So for two weeks, I was basically like spun out, mentally ill, really. I had no idea that benzos could do that to a person. Yeah. And uh, I started to just watch YouTube, but I'd never really bothered with the live chats and stuff. But I started to get involved in CW Chanter's live chat. And I thought, wow, people are like talking to me and being kind to me. And I felt so isolated. And yeah. So part of the idea of starting the channel was to continue the conversation with those guys, but just show them a little bit of my occulty ways. Because CW, he's got his own thing. You know, he, he digs magic, but he's not an occultist as such. You know? Right. I appreciate so I was that. Like, come, come to my house. You know, I've been to your house. Come to mine. So yeah. the original idea was like a video diary of me doing the daily uh golden dawn rituals you know but that got pretty bored and really quick to be honest yeah so uh then i, I kind of branched out and now i'm just trying to just I, I, now i feel a lot freer with the channel and i just experiment you know once i've realized this isn't going to be like an instruction you know because i'm not an expert i can't teach anyone anything they can buy a book that will tell them how to do it better than i can so what i'm doing is just just 
doing stuff creatively. You know, I've always been into music, painting, and it's just a, a continuation of that for me. I wanted to ask you too about that, you know, music and painting, your praxis, that confluence. How do you feel as being, you know, quintessentially, it's your, your I hate to use the term, but a YouTuber, right? Yeah, There's yeah. someone that, that is vlogging your, your practice and all that. Like, how has that been going for you? What has been the reception, <laughs> you know, the idea from, from the world at large? Because you're, you're putting your praxis, you're putting your honesty yeah. out there. And I oh, absolutely adore that about you. But, yeah. you know, I wonder I, if there's... Sometimes I really wonder why I do it. Right. And, you know, because I'm, I'm not really a, an extrovert. I think part of the drugs thing was to make me more extroverted. Because I always love people and I love being around people. But I'm not naturally an extrovert. So perhaps the drugs and, you know, I still enjoy drinking. I usually have a couple of glasses of wine when I'm doing a podcast or I would just clam up, you know. Yeah. So... I often do doubt the wisdom. Why am I doing this? And I don't know. It's just like some, it's a, it's a niche that's just got to be scratched. I think I got used to performing in the band. Maybe I need an audience. Maybe I'm some kind of weird narcissist. It is, it's fun. It's like watching the, you know, watching your videos back. And although I never really watch my videos back, I watch the, uh, the recordings. I can't watch live streams. I just find it excruciating. Yeah. Do you think there's something about um, maybe hyperlizing, hyperlizing, hyper, you know, making the, these hyper sigils about, you know, these, these things that you're doing, these, these, uh, these uh, incantations, these spoken word, you know, audiomancy type things and sharing your praxis. Do you think that that emboldens uh, the, the work? Yeah. Yeah. I, do I think, think so. I are. think it, Yeah. I, I was think they say, are think... kind of uh, audiovisual spells in a way, although I never realized that till quite recently. It seems like you and me, the reason why, you know, we, I think we inherently gravitate towards YouTube is the connection or the connectivity yeah. between viewers. Also, the honesty of having your face on fucking camera. Yeah. And yeah, not having think... to tell outrageous lies about being best friends with Bale and Lucifer, you know? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, Lucifer, yeah. come over here, man, bro. Right. Fuck me. No, I'm just <laughs> um, but it, to me, that makes uh, that's what makes this so appealing. And for somebody like me to have a kind of redemption arc with magic and to document it, I think is that much more poignant. So I, I just always really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, uh, I, I saw in one of your videos that you, you said something about magic as redemption. And I never, yeah. really, re I'd never really thought about it like that, but it, it totally is. You know, it, it certainly redeemed my life in many ways. But I right. always thought of it as a continual pushing of the psychic envelope because I'd always been excessive in my ways. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. if, I, if I did something, I would have to, have to do it to the extreme extent. Yeah, uh, I think that's why I fell into addiction, but it's also why, you know, the the birth of the Saroth Image channel was really triggered by, I'm going to call it a working, I was thinking about this today, and it, it wasn't just a series of psilocybin trips, it was a working with the person that started it all off. Um, last summer we did like five or six really intense psilocybin trips. And that was when I was just coming out of the, I failed to come off the Valium, by the way. I just had to say, no, this is too much. Right, right. After, after like four weeks of intense mental and physical agony, I was just, okay, just put me on two mils a day. That's fine. So after that, we decided to embark upon a, a major um, psilocybin adventure. So we had like one before the summer solstice, one on the summer solstice, one kind of midway between that and uh, Sawain. But the real big one for me was the one before the summer solstice. And that was when, I don't know, for me, you know, I'd, I'd experimented with psilocybin because in, uh, in Aberdeen, they grow quite plentifully. I don't know, there's an urban myth. It might not be an urban myth that they now spray fungicides on them. But when oh, I was yeah. in like uh, 12, 13, 
you would just go to the football pitch and there would be just growing all over the place. It was the same in the Pacific Northwest where I just came from. Yeah, very abundant. Abundant. And, you know, all the guys, all their brothers knew about them. So we were taking them very young before our brains were properly formed. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) so there was a night, a a very um, strong trip I had in the Duthie Park where I realized that, gosh, this isn't all, you know, the, the mundane little childish fantasies I had about life and growing up there was much more to it than that you know there was another dimension if you like I didn't really understand it but everything looked so beautiful and I thought well this is like the Garden of Eden I'd never heard of Terence McKenna I had no nothing to judge it by you know it was just my own personal experience but that really opened me up and after that I really got into art like Van Gogh or Van Gogh as you would say um I noticed that his paintings were just exactly like you would see on a psilocybin trip. The wavy lines, the excessively bright colours, you know. So that dude was tripping uh, involuntarily, I presume. Involuntarily? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I I mean, but, you know, that brings me to a good point. I don't know if you want this out there about what you do for a living, but working with people with, you know, uh, I think the proper terminology is people with disabilities right people yeah, first yeah, terminology sure. yeah. um i i myself have had a uh a lit well i was diagnosed with uh mental uh disability not disabilities that sounds like i'm i was yeah. bipolar i had been diagnosed yeah, kinda, bipolar yeah. for for since i you know i was like a late teenager didn't do a shit about it I uh, thought I'm not going to be a slave to a drug and instead was a slave to pretty much every drug. <laughs> yeah. Every other drug. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I wonder too, like, you know, the, there's that whole cliche about the shamanistic experience about how you look for those dented consciousnesses, you know, those like ones that kind of glean elsewhere and like literally think outside the box. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, uh, if 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 what we're told by anthropologists is to be believed, then people with uh, various mental peculiarities, <laughs> you know, the schizophrenics, That's a good the term. bipolar, yeah. and, you know, a lot of people in the magic communities that I've met on Facebook and stuff have either had drug problems, bipolar, schizoaffective disorder, right. person at borderline, part. You know, we're all a little bit mad. Yeah, yeah. So like you certifiably. Know, you, yeah, but, um, <laughs> you know, magic is not something a normal person really wants to do because it takes you far out of your, your realms of comfort. And, you know, it's not... It, I've often thought that magic was a dangerous and destructive thing, but it's not. It's not. Right. It, it, it breaks down to build up in a better way. I always use the, the lightning struck tower from the tarot as a perfect example of what kind of initiation does stuff like absolutely that. it's to me that's just, like the most magical card oh you know? absolutely that yeah. is my uh that's my favorite card it just zaps all the false bullshit and all those bricks and the, the red person and the blue mm-hmm. person are the hemispheres of the brain and uh you know that's what magic does it reduces you to rubble and then it builds you up uh prometheus rise and robert anton wilson right classic way of describing that in another way where we're involuntary programmed you know we have um times in our life when we're susceptible to programming and it just imprints on accidental stuff whatever's going on on around and our damaged young lives is what we imprinted on so with magic it gets a chance and i'm not sure of the mechanisms again that it gives us a chance to deliberately imprint new positive stuff I mean, that makes, yeah, that makes absolutely, I mean, I was just meditating on this the other day um, about how I can, I think I, I experience ego deaths at a, at a hyper rate as comparatively to when I was young and, you know, screwed up on different things. So those needed to be the big deaths. Now it's like every, every day or like where we are now thinking about, you know, I don't think that this is supernatural. I think this has everything to do with, you know, our inherent consciousness or whatever. To me, that's also a little death. And it's just little deaths and little deaths until hopefully there's no, 
there's there's no need for it anymore but maybe not maybe hopefully that there is you know i i think i can get addicted to the ego deaths i told this to yeah. a friend recently um i probably on the podcast that comes out before this one which is funny i don't mean to put this out there too much uh but sneak I, preview <laughs> well i mean uh, it's i'm i'm just getting getting real with some past shit um I uh, subletted my my room when I first moved to Portland, when I jumped a train and, and just ended up living in Portland. I subletted my room to a mushroom dealer, and he, he gave me mushrooms like I was to sell them. Yeah. I did not sell them. I took yeah, them of for months, you know, like, and I got addicted to coming down. I got addicted to the somatic. I got addicted to like, oh, man. You know, the the other realms are far scarier than this. I can handle this. You know, and that, that really showed me a lot as far as, I think, drug use and as far as even magical praxis, you know. Yeah, I got to an interesting place. And, you know, a lot goes back to that. I keep pointing over there because that's where my mm-hmm. bed is. Um, that, that time when I, I tried to come off the benzos and I was also doing like the Golden Dawn um practice every day faithfully Mm -hmm. and I really did get to a point where I felt like I was shedding layer after layer of programming until I found that there was up there there was no center to me at all I was just nothing and it it was scary but it was also kind of liberating to know that you're you're not your programs you're not your parents you're not your school you're not your religion um yeah you are just uh I don't know just a nothingness really well, and to be honest, and you would understand this too, like, okay, um, you would think that the, like, my detox from heroin or opiates would have lasted once and I'd learn. No, it happened a few times, right? Uh, but every time was this teacher and about humiliation. Oh my God, about like learning to walk again. I remember I got got over it in some dilapidated apartment in Phoenix, Arizona when I was like 26. It sounds like a, a bad pulp novel, you know? (laughs) And I like, basically I had to learn how to walk and stand like straight again. I was, I, I I probably shouldn't make, and some would argue I didn't make it out. You know, (laughs) like here, here we are, you know, this is all just a dream in a way, but yeah. Yeah. I was almost fascinated. Me it was, uh, yeah, the humiliation, sorry. that's what I want to say. It's like yeah. the hum- humbleness of it, yeah. Yeah, but um, do you think, were you into William Burroughs and Crowley and stuff before you started taking heroin? Uh, yes, definitely William Burroughs. Absolutely yeah. William Burroughs. Uh, yeah. I, got ex- I got suspended from school for bringing lo- naked lunch to high school. Um, and that just made me love it more. You know, yeah, um, yeah. you could you could have just put that in a gun and shot the administration, like, <laughs> I, like that was that's what really. I mean, I, it's not the only reason, but you know, my father bought me like a first edition of Cities of Red Night, you oh, know, a wow. couple of years wow. ago. Yeah. So it's like, I've always been a big Burroughs fan, yeah, but this brings another question I want to talk to you, but you had a point. I apologize. Yeah. It's just, I had a weird perverse way of justifying my addiction. It's like, mm. but it was talked about a worm that was kept permanently uh, strung out on heroin. So the, the junk cells die and then you're, you know, the, the new cells are born. And I was like, Hey, this is keeping me young. Yeah. I mean, it does. It, it uh, does. It. I mean, you know, <laughs> you get I'm amphibious. Fifty years old and I don't look um, a, a day over thirty. Mm-hmm. No, it, that's always been like to me, like such a, a mythological, weird elixir. You know, of course yeah, you get yeah. addicted to this thing that ruins your life and makes you forever young. You know, yeah. I don't know. It's just you can't write that stuff. Well, it's like but, a bit like a portrait of Dorian Gray, isn't it, Oscar Wilde? Right. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. The picture stays young, but you grow ugly and twisted in the inside. Yeah, the picture but, in your mind of your self-image. Yeah. Yeah. Keeps, yeah. And as Butters yeah. say, you, you really get to know human nature when you're uh, down your last, you know, and you'll do anything for a, a hit. Yeah. 
I mean, that was, it was definitely my darkest hour. Um, what's funny though, to share in context, I, uh, was kicking this shit and I just, I, I basically went out to Arizona, which was the place that I think all of my troubles began as a child. And I thought that I could get right with it, but instead I used it as like this vacuum of, you know, just grossness yeah, to be, to be nice about it. And, uh, that's when I came back into magic was towards the end is, you know, writing the intentions, creating sigils, stuff I had learned years prior mm -hmm. and knew it, but never took it so terribly seriously. And some would argue that that's, you know, you're, you're basically uh, supplementing a faith or you're, you know, and I would say that's good. That's healthy, you know? Yeah, I'm sorry. So I don't know. But yeah, that's right. And that's kind of, it, it seems similar to where you were. Like that's, you got out of the darkness, you use this stuff, even though it was Reiki, it was, you know, uh, new agey, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> but at least it was something that kind of sub supplanted a faith in you that like there is it a wonderment had, instead of a meaning. Vacuum. It had meaning, yes. it had meaning. Yeah. And the channeling was useful at the time, you know, it really, mm -hmm. And I think if two people work together, uh, you know, there's the thing about the third mind. I don't want to get too Burroughs, in sure. here, but there yeah. is definitely, and I've noticed that with the Sam and Baz and Davey that I'm working with at the moment, that we really are starting to fall into this weird synchronicity mesh. Chapel Perilous is uh, yep. Anton, what we call it. Yeah. The, the synchronicities are just firing off all over the place. So I do think that group work is very powerful. And it's hard to be a, a solo magician, you know, to keep yourself motivated, to keep doing the rituals. To sure. Doing... And often I just, at the moment, I'm really not doing any practice at all. I'm just yeah. kind of um, just being. I, I appreciate you, that. And it comes in cycles. All things are cycles for me, you know. Right. I'll be tremendously creative for a while, and then I'll just flatline, and then it'll pick up, you know. it's It's got some kind of rhythm to it that I haven't quite fathomed yet. Well, how is it being amongst a group of peers that are all magically inclined, uh, knowledgeable, you know, uh, all non, pretty non-judgmental of any other's, you know, inclinations? Like, how is that? That's got to be pretty magical with the last word. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's been very empowering, you know, and we all come at the, the subjects from completely different places, you know. Right. Sam yeah. is kind of a Voodoo kind of guy. Um, mm -hmm. Baz is more Western tradition, but he does believe in uh, spirits and stuff. Davey is more like the, the technical guy, and he's really into comics and uh, Druidism. So we all really come from different parts. But I think it, it does work when, when you put us all together. And we've had some great fun doing like spirit box sessions. Right. Uh, you know, in the spirit box where you, you flick mm -hmm. through the radio. The flick flicks through the radio, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, So I've had some interesting stuff. I mean, uh, I have to say, um, I'm in a relationship with a beautiful, that was kind of synchronous. It is. Everything seemed to come together last summer. After yeah. uh, 2018, June, July, I met Sora Star. Um, I had my zero experience, and then I started the YouTube channel. I had those big trips. Yeah. After years in the wilderness, it was like, finally. Well, it's like you're still tempering your want and need for knowledge by having these awesome podcasts and, you know, discussions with people. It's almost like that is that is the only praxis you need. Yeah. Right? Uh, well, at the moment, it absolutely. Yeah. Is. And, you know, it's, it's like Baz is in Australia. Sam's in uh, America. Davey mm -hmm. is Scottish. He's just down the road. But I could have never come across these people in Aberdeen, you know, a tiny little, by American standards, it's barely even a town, but we call it a city. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's like uh, 250,000 people, you know. So they had one little um, comic book store. I've never been into comics, but they used to sell like Wiser and uh, Crowley, Golden Dog mm -hmm. stuff. So I started, uh, that's where I found all my magic books. 
Well, I mean, I'm I'm sure they would. It's I mean, comics and magic have been the most the coolest confluence, you know, yeah, for yeah. the modern age. But um I want to talk to you a little bit about just you know, it sounds like where you're at where I'm at where you're taking less in from maybe the o cultural aspects. You're you're taking less in from this new neo uh you know, magic renaissance you're you're taking more from in in self in yourself and like yeah. the people that you talk to yeah. but i wanted to bring that up because you know that's that's been a fun topic with everyone i've talked to how how do you feel about where magic is right now well interesting times isn't it i mean the internet is just blowing everything open before like i say before the, I mean, who could have imagined the technology that we've got now that we are now talking instantaneously? It's like you're in my room, you know? Right. S smartphones and all that shit. Um, it's almost like the stuff that you used to really have to work hard for is now so accessible. It almost becomes, you can't even, I can't be bothered looking at it, you know? Things that I would have been so excited about getting in a, a paper form. It's like, okay, every grimoire that's ever published, you can find somewhere on the internet. There's almost like too much information. Yeah. And it's hard to know. There's not many people that I follow, really, hardly any occultists that I really, oh my God, he's, he's a new podcast. I must find out what's <laughs> going on with this person or that person, you know? Yeah. It's just absolutely. And to be honest, there aren't that many quality magic, uh, youtubers or whatever platform they use you know there are a few authors that are like kind of you know i mean you yourself speak to mitch horowitz i've got a lot of respect for him carl abrahamson mm -hmm. robert anton wilson i love but he's unfortunately passed away right. you know you've got your I, I don't want to name names but you've got your kind of uh, become a living god crew who've got their own kind of take on things and then there's a lot of you know david griffin's tragic take on uh, you know the golden dawn he turned it into hogwarts yeah you when know, you also got like the michael hughes you know buying trump you know stuff it, it's, it's it's almost it's, gotten into like this political yeah world. it's 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 very silly to be honest i still go back to my uh favorites you know crowley burrows robert anton wilson a few yeah. others I just, I wonder sometimes, like, what is, would I be stifling other people by going, hey, you know, you're not supposed to put all your eggs in one basket with one, one guru. This guru is not going to start the revolution. And I use guru uh, intentionally negatively, <laughs> you know, no. uh, because there is a large group of them now that, you know, want to be the the best occult, you know, or the best occultists, or like is the reason why modern occultism is what it is, I'll just say. Or like you said, you know, the uh, the the YouTube hole of, you know, what the left-hand path, quote-unquote, has become, you know. And it's, a part of me is, is it's a, I'm offended, but I shouldn't be. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I honestly, I'm coming around to think, and I, and you know, I never thought I could be a cultist because I'd never had any sort of um, clairvoyance as a child. I'd never seen little green men dancing in, you know, the moonlight. I'd never been abducted by a UFO. <laughs> but I do think, uh, like music or art, you've either got it as an occultist or you haven't. And if if you need to hang on a guru's every word and have to pay for demon summonings and readings, you're really barking up the wrong path. If you really do want to be an occultist, you've got to find your absolute own way of doing things. It's a very individual shamanistic path, you know what I mean? And I think shamans are born and not made. Ah, that's a good, that's a good thing to talk about. Um, yeah, to, to a degree, I, but born I mean, you can study, even you through can experience, learn. right? Yeah. Born or learn. not. You can learn, but you, I think you learn from experience. That's how you learn, learn, right? And it takes That's a how lot we have of to. 
Yeah. I mean, I'm in this been... modern world, you know, talking about Burroughs, talking about Kenneth Grant, talking about Crowley. These are all people that had cancel culture written all over them if they were happening now, you know? And I think that there's something missing in the modern age about redemption, about, you know, people trying to strive well to do well. And so these people that come out as crystal clean are very suspect. Yeah. I think, yeah. You, you know, you have to struggle with your, your magic every day. If you're, if you're not constantly in a, a confused daze or at least 50% <laughs> of the time, you're doing something wrong. You know, if you just think, okay, this follows that. And then I do this ritual and that happens and oh, it's all fine. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. I, I don't sense the struggle and the inner, uh, you know, uh, confusion right. and, and drowning in a sea of weird languages and uh, weird vision experience. I don't get the sense with these people. I think they're putting on a show and possibly trying to make money and sell books, possibly, if, if they can even write a book. You know, it's funny. I think about that, too. And I think about how, to me, there's more magic in a comic book and in somebody's intentional creation of another world than there is in, yeah, that. I mean, know? I guess. I mean, I guess the the circuses and sideshows that some of these people put on are a kind of magic, but it's a kind of carne magic, and they can't honestly believe that the stuff that they're talking about is true. They're trying to sell it to people to make a living, and I think yeah. that's gr- very dishonest. You know, I I try. I've never asked for donations. I'm, I would love to, if people want to give me donations, please do, but I would never go out and ask for them. I think, yeah, right. if I write a book, you buy the book, that's an honest transaction. But if you're going to, if I'm going to ask you for $2,000 for me to put this um, spell, uh, you know, come on. Yeah. No, it gets it gets hairy. I'm glad I, I just, it's so funny. I just think we're both synchronous in ourselves and where we are right now. And you keep saying that this is cyclical. You know, who knows what I'll feel in the other way. And to me, that's the healthiest way to be. Doubt means so much in this praxis, Absolutely. like as a, as a whole, you know. If you just accept every single phenomena as being absolute proof that, that there's, you know, God is talking to you or Horus is living in your back shed, you know, you're, you're, you really have to put things under the microscope and... Uh, you know, be rigorous in your common sense because I have seen people get swept away with this stuff and start to have delusional ideas, you know, especially people that are a little bit, you know, uh, crazy in the first place. And I would put <laughs> both of us in that category. If we yeah. just start blindingly accepting any sort of fragment of uh, gobbledygook that comes to us in meditation, oh my God, I'm the prophet of the new aeon. I mean, how many prophets of the new aeon have we had since probably? You know I mean? It's funny though. Narcissism seems to be the most intrinsic value of of these folks, <laughs> and especially when you know I, I, I won't deny that being on TV, which YouTube right. feels like, you, you know, you you, can, you are absolutely on TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. YouTube. I, like, I don't ah, know anybody else. Yeah, it's awesome. It's great. Yeah, I just yeah. yeah, YouTube is our TV. And that's amazing. That's user operated. We can go into like all the troubles that we might find with the content that we upload from that. But uh, I really appreciate it. I really appreciate your channel. Oh, thank you very much. And I, I really dig yours. But like when, if you were to ever be a part of kind of an international art collective, like being from a media that has garnered what you need from like say youtube from what 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 you're doing multimedia wise like what would you want from that thing what would you need from that thing that's a hard one isn't it i think yeah uh for me art is about like legacy like leaving something behind i don't think that people are necessarily going to get it this time around it's like I used to have the same feeling about painting, not so much about like music when I was in the band, because that was more like playing gigs and you know, people get it right away. Yeah. It's it's just um leaving some proof that you were alive and contributing and maybe inspiring others. 
contributing to the sort of tide of of good stuff. It's <laughs> yeah. a very vague way of putting it. But you know, there's so much bullshit and lies and and damaging stuff out there that if we can like enlighten people and educate them slightly and mm -hmm. stop them perhaps from making the same mistakes that we've made, you know, yeah. like people like us, if I was 18, if I'd seen someone that I trusted and respected saying, don't take fucking heroin, it's a waste oh. of, it's going to kill you or waste I mean, 20 years of your life, you know? I think people are so afraid to talk about that. That's why I've been so... Yeah. And you know, I, okay. I still worry about talking about it. I, I tend not yeah. to talk about it on my own channel. I used to be so paranoid when I was in my last job because I thought, what if somebody, you know, even though I changed my name, they could trace mm -hmm. me through Facebook and they could somehow find my channel, find me talking about magic. Even being into magic is enough to make them like, oh, he's a bit of a weirdo, you know? Oh, totally. I, uh, you know, I uh, actually the first conversation I ever had with Mitch Horowitz, he told me, and I, it's like, if you look at the past 30 interviews I've done, I can take one nugget of wisdom that I've actually applied, that I've been appreciative of. And that first one with Mitch Horowitz was, use your name. You know, yeah. even though I'm going by my middle name and last name, but it's pretty easy to figure it out. Yeah, I saw like, that interview. Yeah, and like, I, re I really appreciated uh, the idea of, you know, trolls are gonna come. <laughs> you're gonna, you're gonna get shit on. That's just the nature of the internet now. But I think the point of this, you know, quote unquote crusade is to be honest about it, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, not not. I mean, like you. This is your name. Like Keats Ross is my magical name. Honestly, you know. Yeah. I make music under different characters or different names, but this is the truest one. Yeah. yeah, but there is also what I felt. I mean, my name is Stephen Ray. It's a very prosaic mm -hmm. sort of uh, normal name, and I don't think the Stephen Ray experiment would have quite the same <laughs> effect. Though Ray uh, is is a pretty cool Ray and Ray is yeah, yeah yeah Ray. And if you if you rearrange my name, it kind of comes to Nefitz Ra and all this kind of stuff. Ooh. But. Yeah. Um, I do feel like there was a process in that. Uh, maybe are we recording still? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll edit out all the. Uh... Yeah, there was a part in that uh, formative uh, mushroom trip where I'd, I felt like I'd been dropped. You know, I'd taken a, a lot. It was like seven or eight dried grams of very good local uh, psilocybin mushrooms, mm -hmm. and I felt like I'd been dropped in a deep ocean of. Oh God! When I first got down there, it was like. Oh, I could barely breathe. And there were all these <laughs> kind of skeletal birds flying around, uh, and all these demons as I perceived them. Oh, I'll cut you a deal, man. I'll get you out of here. And, you know, because I felt like I was kind of in hell in a way. And I gradually rose and fought my way through all this uh, psychic detritus and got to the place where I, I saw myself as a grizzled old white person, a kind of Vikingish looking person. That's actually why I got these runes tattooed, uh, because in the vision I saw myself covered in tattoos and runes. And it was like, yeah, you're going to be Saroth the Mage and you're going to do this and you're going to do that. And I thought, yeah, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Are those yeah. runes? Uh, uh, they're sigils, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think Retired. it is going to, yeah. Well, Stick got, and poke, yeah. Yeah, I've got the eye in the triangle there. and. ISIS is all things, all things are ISIS there, and a few more. I we share nationalities too, you know, Ross is obviously. Oh, yeah, Scott. Ross is very Scottish, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and you uh, look like a Peely Wally Scott. Uh, yeah, what does that mean? <laughs> Peely Wally means pale. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah. It's uh, the gray. The gray does me well. Yeah, yeah. I like the, the uh, what's that hat, hat called again? Butters wore one. Uh, it's not a trilby, fedora. It's a fedora, that's the one. Yeah. It's a hard one. It's it's not unlike magic. It's gotten a lot of flack from people that don't know what they're wearing. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's you, sir. Well, I appreciate it. But yeah, I always wondered, you know, across the pond, like we, you are an emblematic figure for a certain multimedia 
situation to put it very lightly you know like you are you're putting yourself out there you're being honest you're 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 putting yourself out there, which is yeah. so big these days. Yeah, it's the real me. It's, it's yeah. There's no uh, masks or disguises there, I hope. I love that. So what, who cares about a name, you know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, in the sense that, like, of course, yeah, take another name. It's your face, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, like, I've always written uh, music or done things under characters, and I've been writing a lot about you know, it's very self-serving in a way. <laughs> like a good writer never just writes about himself, but a good yeah. magician always writes about himself. Well, it's a, you know, it's the <laughs> only, you know, from, from being a, you know, I, I did English at university and I was very into creative writing and I was in the creative writing society and did poetry readings and stuff. Um, you have to write about what you know. If, if you try and write, you know, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. Unless you're extremely, extremely talented. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the spilling of words onto the page, that's a, that's a magic. That's, that's leaving time binding, isn't it? It's, um, yeah. The written language thing, the, the, the art leaving any kind of mark that can be seen by other people when you're not around is a magical act in my mind. So tell me about what's what's the future. What what where is the experiment going? I never know from one day to the next. Um, I love my, that. My immediate plans are to perhaps have really, you know, I'd kind of gone off. You know how you kind of reject your early influences. Oh God, I'm so tired because I had Burroughs and and all those guys coming out my ears. But now I've kind of returned to Burroughs. And I'm reading the, my favorite novel of his, Place of Dead Roads, again, mm -hmm. getting to know Kim Carson's again. So my, my next video, I think, will just be a reading from that book. But I am getting very bored. You know, I've got a very simple, I'm not a technological person. I don't understand computers. I'm very, you know, I can, I can work vlog it, where you get a bunch of photos cram them together and then sure, so weird, yeah. you know, so I, I make my own, but I can't play an instrument either. I can play a uh, harmonica. That's anything in one key I can play. I was a vocalist in the band. That's how I got by. Hey, that's and that's an instrument. That is an instrument. Yes. Uh, perhaps the, the most difficult instrument. No, it's not. Yeah. Guitars. I mean, probably the most unadulterated, honest instruments. The one instrument I've had the worst, yeah, but I tried Feelings to learn. <laughs> I tried to learn uh, guitar and piano. As I, I just couldn't get. I just. I've got no. One thing about me is I'm not like. A, if I'm not immediately good at something, I tend to just abandon it. You know. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, yeah, I, I know how that goes. I, I'm in many ways a dilettante, and I, I, I think there's nothing wrong with being a dilettante. I think not enough is said good about people that dabble in this and dabble in that, and you know. You don't have to be an expert. And I think uh, this is something that I got from a, a scar, because I was, when The Lost Word started, it was actually, I wanted to do more sort of in-depth, intellectual, analytical discussions about major figures like Austin Osmond Spear, Burroughs, Castaneda, Kenneth Grant. Which and those were great. This, yeah, yeah. But, they're, but they're difficult, you know, they're difficult people to understand and try and, get across to an audience what these people were meaning, what you think they meant. And I was getting all tied up in knots. And I listened to, synchronicity as ever, I listened to a Scarlet Imprint um, mm -hmm. interview, and they said that, um, you know, YouTube and these media platforms put people into the position where they've got to act like experts. And I thought, no, we don't have to act like experts. Right, the that's thing missing the do, point of YouTube. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the thing that I want to show is the process. It's, we're not experts, we're just fumbling along like everybody else. So we're, we're certainly no better, right. no cleverer. We're maybe just, you know, doing it just now and maybe that person isn't and maybe we can inspire them to start doing right. it. And you, you can't blame the user for the symptoms of the viewer. You no, know? I was a viewer and a reader and a consumer yeah. long before I ever start, uh, thought of starting my own magical practice although i'd always been into art and writing 
Yeah. So uh, that that makes me think that there is a lot of rub in a way, of course, like a lot of pushback in a way for uh, this glistening of what people think YouTube is. And it's ruining their idea of what YouTube actually is. The whole point of YouTube is that it's you're getting unadulterated, you know, honest shit. But unfortunately, that's not what the majority is probably now these days. Yeah, and, and how do you sift through the mounds and mounds of bullshit to get to those little algorithms? Gems, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and you know, another thing is, you know, uh, the the live chat. I love the live chat because, you know, I get far brighter people in my live chat than I am. <laughs> and I think, right. well, yeah. why don't you make a video? You know, but some people just aren't reckless or vain or narcissistic enough to, I don't think it's that actually. I actually, like I say, I kind of have to hype myself up. I don't necessarily enjoy live streaming and stuff. I, for a while, I just shrunk away from it completely. I thought, oh my God, I know I do that again. Why? Why would anyone want to, put their own ignorance and, uh, you know, <laughs> lack of knowledge on display for all to yeah. see. But then, you know, I'm a reckless kind of guy. I love that. Yeah, no, at first, you know, with the podcast, I thought I'd, you know, maybe I should edit out all the uh, disinflections or what are they called? Disfluences, mm -hmm. you know, and like, or all, or, and all of the ums mm, and uh yeah, yeah. yeah and i know i know podcasters that do that and to me it sounds like they never take a breath and i think what's yeah. so uh lovely about podcasting what's so lovely about hearing people speak is their rhythm and is their idea of yeah. it's natural conversation when they speech. breathe yeah. yeah when they breathe yeah. they're trying to mine for these ideas yeah i actually watched a video tonight and it was like fast edits, you know, mm. chum, chum. and it was just horrible to watch. I have to say, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. Oh. And it's just too busy. So I do like the, you know, I think with uh, the lost word podcast, because Davey is such a demon on the editing skills at first we recorded and you know, we did, it was pretty much live, but we, we cut Kieran there. But then the last one we did was just a spur of the moment. I'd done that um, Crowley's initiation. Right. That thing, that introduction he did, prologue, whatever you call it. And I just said, let's do a live stream tonight with Crowley. Everybody knows about Crowley. And it, I think that was the best show we'd done because it was just so natural. It flowed. And the live chat, you know, you get, a, you get an energy. It's like, you know, you played gigs. You know, you get an energy off the audience and you bounce yeah. it back and it's it's kind of like a you're it's kind of like a tennis match you're 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 throwing them something they're throwing something back to you and i think with recorded shows you miss that friction slightly i do enjoy the cut and thrust of a, a live show although some of them have gone you know pear shape for me to be honest this i don't know why this made me think of it maybe it's because there's a kind of a power dynamic between uh, you know, the that, that's host exactly and the audience. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about the the idea within the magical realm of like hexes, of curses, of of putting your for you know your intent into harming somebody else? I disapprove for a start. I yeah. don't think I would never I, I mean I, I have and weirdly, this is uh, might be an amusing anecdote, but when I was in the grip of addiction and you had like gangs kind of, you know, I had my little gang there and they had the, their little gang there and one of their gang ripped off one of my gang and it all got... Uh, <laughs> so I did actually deliberately curse two people. The first one... Now, this is bizarre and I don't make shit up. That is one thing about me. It's all true. Uh, mm. The very night that I cursed him, uh, he had a, a terrible asthma attack and was hospitalized. All my, it was my little brother's friends that were around at the time. They were like, oh my God. And then about two nights later, flushed with success and filled with evil juju, right. I cursed another guy and he had a car crash 
the exact same night, no fatalities, you know, he was, the car was bashed up, but nothing too serious. But it's like, fuck, did I cause that? So I've never done it again. So I do think, you know, discounting supernaturalism as I do, that there is some mechanism for cursing people. Because right. I, had a, I had a fallout with a, quite a major occultist just around the time where a terrible incident happened at work. It wasn't my fault, but I was in charge at the time. A guy left a, a pan of oil on a stove, black smoke, fire alarm went off, major incident. I was hauled across the coals for it. I was like, is that him? And it's a dangerous mindset to get into. You're looking for curses and, you know, so. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think I think they do. I think it is possible. I don't know how, but. Yeah, I think they are possible, but they're unethical kids, so don't do it. Do you think there's there's some sort of reciprocation, some sort of penance? To me, magic always felt like there is some sacrifice, whether it be small or big, that you do to 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 make it happen. And really, yeah. to me, in the end, that's like you 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 want to be better, so you sacrifice what's not making you better. You know, yeah, yeah. to like put it real simply. But when it comes to putting all your focus on the will of somebody else or ruining somebody else, do you think there's reciprocation in that? You mean, can it rebound? And, uh... Not not like the Wiccan, you know, thing. But like, yeah. you know, in a way, I think to me, uh, the scary thing has always been if I flooded my brain or my consciousness thinking that I could affect someone so negatively by being so negative to me that's the curse on me yeah 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 absolutely but the you know i always you know the psychological model would tell you that the person has to know they've they've been cursed before it takes effect you know because oh right that person just cursed me so i'm starting to feel all these psychosomatic <laughs> feels. but these two people didn't know i'd cursed them at all and if i was cursed which i still you know i People private message me on Twitter saying, "My God, that sounds like a psychic attack. Have you been cursed? Have you?" Oh, right. well, I did. Dion Fortune. Yeah, I did. Yeah, psychic self defense. Great book, by the way. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I mean, magic for me is not about hexing and power over others and binding demons. It's about creativity, joy, spontaneity. You know, living life. Um, as the master of your own destiny that's the that's the thing you've got to do is uh really realize that all the shit going on in your life is your life and you're responsible for it it's not these guys out there that are making you do this i hate people that don't take responsibility for their own shit and it took me a long time i don't think i was ever a big parent blamer or oh that's such a hard childhood i i, I always have been reasonably good at taking responsibility for myself you've got to take it to the nth degree if you pass up you know you've got to really embrace that idea of everything is either your fault or your credit you know it's, right. it's your life you know it's almost like the biggest magical practice is forgiveness and gratitude yeah and yeah. acceptance and forbearance acceptance bravery it's all that shit it's it, the hero's journey you mentioned it before Mm -hmm. It really is. You've got to, you know, some who was it that said that unexamined life isn't worth living? You've really got to put your own life under the microscope. And I think that's what a, a daily practice, although I drift in and out of it, for some reason, the Golden Dawn practice, although it's a Christian Judaic system, you know, the words are all yote, vave, you know, nothing that I believe in, but it still stimulated a response which dramatically seem to change my brain chemistry and and tell you is, if, well yeah go ahead sorry yeah that that's the magic that's the mystery isn't it how the fuck does that work yeah i was gonna say it worries me when there's a system of belief that needs you to cons or conscribe to something that is uh daily well not daily i shouldn't say but you know that is so systematically and mathematically placed upon 
the purveyor. It's almost like an instruction manual for them to figure out how to, I hate to use the word control, but how to, how to take power from you in a way. Yeah. And yeah. Um, uh, but for me being so undisciplined and so wasted, I think that the golden dawn, which was not, a you know, it, w- it wouldn't have been the book that I chose. It was because it fell off the shelf. Right. I'm far more, Is this I, the, I, the new guy that runs the golden dawn? The, uh, Oh God, no, David Griffin. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Don't even mention that fool. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> now this is by a, a very bright guy called Liam Thomas Christopher, Kabbalah Magic. Uh, nothing to do with the new Hogwarts Order of the Golden Dawn. Mm-hmm. Um, very well constructed book. He pretty much takes the psychological approach as well. Um, but for me, something that I want, you know. I was far more attracted to a book like uh, Lieber, Psychonaut, and Null, and some of the Chaos Magic right. stuff. Peter Carroll, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But um, I think for for the time in my life it was, I kind of needed that discipline. And I, I, it was like a course in martial arts. It taught me things that I'd never done before, like have a daily routine. My daily routine was go out, score, come back, right. lie down. Lie down for long periods of time and dream about things that would never happen. And then all of a sudden I was really, you know, neophyte, I was getting there. Zelator, really, I had some breakthroughs. I had some truly spontaneous visions, although I'd I, I'd never stuck rigidly to the instructions. I always felt free to tweak them here and there. As I, I think that's where I'm coming from is, yeah, the I ability to base. engineer your own, yeah. Because I thought, well, if it was good enough for, I mean, it is a cobbled together system, the Golden Dawn, you know, it's got bits of. Uh, yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah, bits of everything. But the, the less, you know, the pentagram rituals, uh, the banishing hexagram rituals, the beautiful poetic invocations, mm-hmm. the the setting, you know, set and setting, you know. It's very, I think magic is like a slow burn psychedelic, actually. It's, yeah, no, like I would a, agree. It almost seems like method too, like the Lee Strasberg kind of acting. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. You act it, and then you eventually become it. Yeah, and have right. it. The, yeah, that's that's very perceptive, actually. I, that that was floating around in my uh, thing, but I'd never quite put it like that. Yeah, no, I've I've, I've thought about that recently. Um, I think because you know the the point is to to be the super self, the higher self, to act as higher self. So what is that? You have to inhabit the character. You got to live in its shoes. You know, you got to do these things, which we all should do. I mean, this should be universal. Like, I think that we all have this higher inclination for ourselves. And I think it's all attainable to a degree. Sure, there's some aspects that are just, you know, you got to rough out, but like... (laughs) we should all be thinking about how to live big in a way. Yeah. 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 And I think you have to find ways of stretching yourself beyond Mm -hmm. your normal boundaries, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, I used to do like crazy pranayama where I would hold my breath and then do like fire breath. Yeah. 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 And with the psilocybin, it really felt like I was pushing myself beyond any normal boundaries and uh i always describe it as claiming you know reaching for unclaimed psychic territory like Mm -hmm. you feel like nobody's been here before you know and that might be just a drug adult delusion but i don't really see psilocybin as a drug i see it as a sacrament i don't either i i really don't see it as a drug either and you know i always tell like my younger brothers i'd rather you smoke a uh, a joint then drink a beer in a way yeah. you know just yeah. that kind of elevation of shit yeah. but i i often wonder like is it the physical aspect we need in magic and like you're talking about you know the dragon breath sort of thing there has to be you need the exasperation yeah there has to be physicality or it's all just um dreams and it has no substance i right. think that 
that it's a, a humbling of, thing, right? I think a lot of magic ritual is is pulling stuff. I mean, you would say in classic Kabbalistic terms, you're pulling stuff from Yetzirah, the form mm-hmm. of the world, into your normal everyday reality. Um, I mean, I do believe the astral world is basically just your imagination. I think we touched on this earlier when uh, yeah, David... but you you also said you know the collective unconscious there could be some pool yeah, yeah, of yeah. everyone's imagination. Oh yeah, that, I think that is for sure because yeah, it, you like know, there's my... an avatar of you maybe. Yeah, yeah, absolutely in that realm. Yeah, and, battling against it. And I am uh, a, a big fan of Terence McKenna and his uh, psychedelic um, discoveries. But he said, you know, you can be sweeping up in the ashram for years, just take one DMT trip or a psilocybin trip. (laughs) And, you know, you don't have to be, you don't have to do all that shit. It's very instant. And a lot of the tradition, you know, um, I think if we're talking about culture, I noticed it seems to be, maybe I'm just not moving in the same circles, but there was a big move away from chaos magic and, postmodernism and everybody was like okay we're getting back into renaissance magic and like where all began the grimoires and the key of solomon a lot of that stuff just seems plain silly to me you know i mean it's yeah you know it just yeah it seems like way more of a product of its time than you know the post idea of it it's like why would you go back to the you know the things that we we've decided were you know, yeah. outmoded. It is outmoded, and that's yeah. that's really the the path that I am on now, and especially when I've got the support of my brothers in the The Lost Word podcast, where we are deliberately trying to push things a little bit further, spirit boxes, technology, anything that works. You know, just yeah. My my basic philosophy is just throw a heap of shit at the wall and see what sticks. You know. I mean, I love the idea of the last word. The last word it reminds me of Billy Childish. You know, uh, the head coats. Yeah. Well, we'll yeah. put the the, right. the was originally a, a typo because Davey can't spell. And I thought, the, ah, yeah, the. Because it's like it's the perfect. temple yeah. of psych- uh, psychic youth and all that. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Loss with an OV in it. But, um, yeah. Uh, I really appreciate the podcast. I love, I love what you're doing, and please be a part of We the Hollowed. Uh, oh, I am. Just, I would love. Yeah, I. What you do know, you think all the great artists have done? They've just thought, will I risk this? You know, Picasso. Yeah. You know, I'm a, a huge Picasso fan, by the way. Yeah, I was gonna say he he probably really liked his stuff. So yeah, I was a huge fan. <laughs> And, you know, I'm into all experimental. Expe- you know, it's just experimental. Right. Just chuck it out there and let, let it bound off people and see what it fires up in their synapses. And it causes, like, a chain reaction of genius. Thanks, man. I appreciate you. All right.